let's suppose that you're eating a, a low carbohydrate diet. So what that means is that you're going to be eating a diet that contains somewhere between, call it 70 to 85% fat in your diet. And then the remainder is going to be fat, uh, uh, protein and carbohydrate. So a low carbohydrate diet uh, has been sort of talked about, you know, for 30, 40, 50 years at this point. At this point, we are now in the ketogenic diet. And the ketogenic diet is basically considered a very low carbohydrate diet. So what that means is that the total number of carbohydrates that they were to suggest per day is 30 grams per day maximum, divided between breakfast and lunch and dinner. So you're eating 30 grams of carbohydrate plus uh, m more than 150 to 170 grams of fat per day. So again, we're looking at like an 80% fat intake, mm -hmm. you know, then the a small amount of carbohydrate and the remainder in protein, okay? So in that situation, when you eat a low carbohydrate diet, you're effectively eating uh, foods that are high in fat, medium in protein. And the fat molecules that are, that are coming inside of your mouth, they're actually locked up as triglyceride in the food that you're eating. So triglyceride literally means glycerol backbone with three fatty acids attached to it. So you're eating you know, a lot of that triglyceride. It comes down your esophagus, it gets into your small intestine. In your small intestine, uh, the, uh, the glycerol backbone is removed from those fatty acids those fatty acids then go through the wall of your small intestine. They get into your lymph system. Your lymph circulates it into your blood. And then from your blood, they circulate uh, in these particles called chylomicrons. Chylomicrons are, are uh, particles that can basically deliver these fatty acids to tissues. So you eat it, they get inside of your blood. Now, these chylomicrons are basically trying to give fatty acids to tissues. So if 100% of those fatty acid molecules ended up inside of your fat tissue or your adipose tissue, then diabetes probably wouldn't exist today. The problem is that those fatty acid molecules, a lot of them do get into your adipose tissue, which is where they belong. It's a perfectly designed storage warehouse to absorb fatty acids from the blood when they're available. But in addition to getting inside of the fat tissue, they also get inside of your muscle. They also get inside of your liver. And that's okay if the total quantity of fat in your diet is maintained at a low level, like Robbie was saying, 10%, mm -hmm. 15%, maybe as high as 20%, okay? But when you're eating a ketogenic diet, again, you're eating 70, 80% fat in your diet. And as a result of that, the amount of fat that gets partitioned inside of your muscle and inside of your liver starts to grow over the course of time. So today you store a little bit, tomorrow you store a little bit more, the next day you store a little bit more, and over the course of time, now your muscle and liver have become effectively fatty acid storage depots in addition to your adipose tissue. So your muscle and liver are designed to store small amounts of fatty acids and inside of each cell, they have this thing called a lipid droplet. The lipid droplet is effectively where the, the fatty acids or, or lipid solu soluble com compounds congregate together. So this lipid droplet starts to grow over the course of time within each liver cell, within each muscle cell. And effectively that cell gets into a high energy state where uh, what it's trying to communicate is like, wow, I have too much stuff inside of me. This lipid droplet has grown. Each one of these fatty acid molecules is worth, uh, is nine calories per gram. And it's, it's a very energy dense molecule. And so the cell effectively says, okay, wait a minute, we need to go into self-defense mode here. And we need to prevent more stuff from coming inside. So if it were able to block more fatty acids from coming inside, it would do so. The problem is that fatty acids can easily get inside of, of tissues. They can easily get inside of your fat, I'm sorry, your, your liver and your muscle because the, the mechanisms to get fat inside of there are not very highly regulated. So because these tissues can't really block too much more fat from coming inside, what they can do is they can, they can block the ability to communicate with insulin because the insulin is a molecule that's mainly designed to allow glucose to enter s tissues in addition to that, glucose can also signal fatty acids and amino acids to come into tissues, albeit just a little bit less powerful I mean, than insulin glucose. Can. Yes, sorry. Right. So what the cells do is they basically say, all right, listen, what if we were to just shut down this insulin signaling pathway? Because if we did that, then when insulin comes knocking at the door, we can basically block pretty much all of glucose from coming in. And we can also block a small amount of fatty acids and a small amount of amino acids from coming inside. So intracellularly, this lipid droplet starts to create a traffic jam. And this traffic jam, you know, basically goes into the, uh, the inside surface of these insulin receptor and starts to alter some of the proteins 
that start the insulin signaling cascade. On the surface of that cell? On the inside of that inside, cell. Okay. Yeah, so the insulin receptor is sort of like out into the surface, and you know, in the extracellular environment, uh -huh. interacting with insulin. But then as uh, when you cross the cellular membrane on the inside, there's a whole bunch of, uh, there's, a, there's another motif in that protein. And if you alter the way that that protein functions, or alter any of its downstream signaling molecules, then you can basically shut down or, or strongly inhibit the action of everything underneath it. So it's basically just a game of dominoes. Let's just like alter the first couple so that nothing <clears throat> else beneath it functions mm -hmm. properly. So this lipid droplet ends up causing a problem and impairing insulin signaling. So as a result of that, the next time that you go and eat a banana or you have a bowl of quinoa or some wild rice as an example, that's carbohydrate rich food. Those carbohydrates enter your digestive system. Those carbohydrate chains get broken down into glucose. Glucose is now in circulation inside of your blood. Glucose has to be accompanied by insulin in order to get inside of tissues. So insulin comes knocking at the door, says, hey, knock, knock. I got this glucose, do you wanna take it up? And the cells respond by saying, we can't take it up right now, sorry. We got all this lipid that we gotta take mm -hmm. care of first. Or some of the cells, can't even hear insulin because they've shut down the entire signaling pathway. So as a result of that, insulin's knocking, it's knocking, it's knocking, it's knocking, saying there's no response, knocking, no response. So as a result of that, the glucose gets trapped inside of your blood. Right. So you have literally one banana, and then you go check your blood glucose two hours later, and you look at the number and you're like, huh, 245? I only had one banana. I guess bananas are bad for me. See, every time I try and eat fruit, my blood glucose goes high. Every time I eat potatoes, my blood glucose goes high. I guess those foods are bad for me. I should eat less carbohydrate rich food. So when that glucose is trapped in your bloodstream with the insulin and the cells are, are sort of refusing to uptake it, does that then prompt additional uh, insulin secretion? So the, the insulin then continues to build in the bloodstream. Like what is the downstream impact of that? And how does that relate to insulin resistance? Yeah, someone knows his biochemistry. Yeah. I like this, I like this. I don't. This is good. <laughs> Trust me, I'm winging it here. No, this is, this is great. So yes, in that situation, what we just described, that is classic insulin resistance, right? So like we talked about earlier, insulin resistance can progress into prediabetes and then eventually to type two. So. In that state, if you've developed this, this level of insulin resistance, a small amount of insulin resistance, then the beta cells inside of your pancreas are saying, you know what? The insulin that we just manufactured and secreted into the blood, it didn't really do much. Let's make more. Mm -hmm. So then they go into sort of overproduction mode. And instead of making, call it five units for a given meal, they're gonna make seven units. And that happens today. And maybe those extra two units, they go and they get the job done and it brings your blood glucose down. Mm -hmm. Then tomorrow, the same thing happens. And then the next day, the same thing happens. And then months <clears throat> and years down the road, before you know it, normally your pancreas was secreting, call it 25 to 30 units of insulin per day. And now that 25 to 30 has grown to 40, 50, 60. Sometimes it can be four to five times as much as you were secreting in the non-diabetic state. So- this domino effect, this cascading series of events can all be tracked back to excess lipid intake, which, which then you know, causes your, your liver and muscle cells to overaccumulate these lipids exactly and right. shut this whole thing down. Exactly right. Wow. Yeah, so you can think of it as like excess accumulation of liver, I'm sorry, excess accumulation of saturated fatty acids in tissues that are not designed to store large amounts of fatty acids that then causes a traffic jam of glucose inside of your blood. Right. And in turn, eating a low carb or a ketogenic diet that's high in fat is basically a masking technique. Because Boom. you're not taking in any carbohydrates, you're not, you're not prompting your, your pancreas to secrete any insulin. So you're under the illusion that you're dealing in the solution, but actually you're you're just basically exacerbating a situation that will manifest the minute you put any carbohydrates into your body whatsoever. So you're actually exacerbating insulin resistance by doing that. You're just not seeing the impact of that until or unless you eat some carbohydrates. That's is that, exactly is right. that exactly accurate? Right. So yeah. you, you, you live in an insulin resistant state by eating a ketogenic diet. And you're making it worse. And you're making it worse over the, over the course of time and you're playing the carbohydrate avoidance game 
which allows you to never challenge your liver or muscle with the, you know, to uptake glucose, large amounts of it. And as a result of that, you literally cannot see that you are living with insulin resistance. And to be fair, I don't want us to get ridiculed on Twitter, okay? So well, that'll happen no matter what. <laughs> uh, if you do a low carbohydrate diet and you lose you get weight, results. You, you get results, yeah. but you also can see some studies showing improvements in insulin sensitivity if they lose weight. So there is a, a small improvement, but it's mm -hmm. not the same magnitude of improvement that we're talking about here. But once you lose the weight and your weight stabilizes and you perpetuate like a low carb diet, you'll be able to kind of maintain that state, right? And your blood work will, will be stable. You're gonna hit a plateau. Yes and no. <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, it is possible, sure. So let's say you lost 40 pounds on a ketogenic diet because weight loss is an inevitable consequence and it's one of the main things that happens. And it's one of the main reasons why people adopt a ketogenic diet. So they lose weight and as a result of losing weight, total cholesterol drops. HDL cholesterol sometimes goes up, triglycerides drop. A1C goes down, fasting insulin goes down, fasting glucose goes down, blood pressure goes down. So all these markers, these biomarkers start to move in the right direction. And you're like, huh, I've done this only for a year. This is fantastic. Now I'm at my normal weight. That's great. Those are short-term results and those are phenomenal. And I'm not gonna take that away from anybody who's experienced that. That's, that's great. But what a lot of people who come to us relay to us is that they say, hey, look, I've been doing this ketogenic thing. I've been doing this low carbohydrate thing for a while, but I can tell that I'm just not functioning. I'm not firing on all cylinders, right? And what that means is that they've either developed or are in the process of developing other chronic conditions like hypertension. Okay, once they've plateaued, now things can move in the wrong direction. Sometimes they get high LDL cholesterol. Mm -hmm. okay? Sometimes they become hypertensive. Sometimes they end up developing really complex digestive problems. They get gas, bloating, constipation, and that's frequent and it prevents them from being able to eat frequently. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, you know, I just, I, I have this brain fog. Like I just cannot think clearly and I don't know what's happening. Uh, a lot of people can't exercise frequently. Mm. And so there's all these sort of like ancillary conditions that begin to accumulate over the course of time. Some of them are diagnosable conditions. Some of them are non-diagnosable conditions. And it generally makes people over the course of a year to two years to three years, depending on the individual, a lot of them are like, ha, huh, I don't know if I can continue or want to continue to do this anymore. It's very difficult to maintain. And the one thing that's happening that you cannot argue or disagree on is that they have eaten themselves into a state of glucose intolerance. They'll say, oh, well, I don't care. Like, I'm not going to eat a banana. Why would because I eat I'm a banana I'm just never going to eat a carbohydrate but, ever yeah. again. So right. they can say that if they want to, that's fine. But the fact is, They've eaten themselves into a state of glucose intolerance, and the only way to get out of it is to lower their fat intake and eat more carbohydrate-rich food, which they will do when they say, oh, yeah, if I want to become more insulin-sensitive and you know, perform well on oral glucose tolerance test, I just have to carb-adapt. Okay, yes, yeah, so you have to start adopting features of the mastering diabetes method to become more insulin-sensitive. In fairness to that, that, um, that individual, that's, that's got to be a scary prospect. Like, if they've been told their whole life or ever since they've been diagnosed that they got to eat low carb and they've been doing it and they've been, they've gotten to a place of stability with that for you to then say, actually, you got to switch gears and do the exact opposite. I, I would imagine that that provokes a little bit of fear in most people. For sure. I mean, there's no question, yeah. but no doubt. I mean, I think you're, you're bringing up a really important topic here, which is that the psychology of this is yeah. just as important as the, the, you know, biochemistry yes. of it. I would say this, the psychology is even more important right. than the biochemistry. Like we can nerd out on biochemistry all day long, but at the end of the day, you know, it, there's a certain amount of like uh, emotional anxiety that it creates in people when all of a sudden you, you say to them, you know, a couple of things like, number one, you can eat potatoes as an example, you can eat fruits. And I think what people do is they translate that message into, oh, so you're saying what I've been doing is wrong, right? And And then it can create a sort of like negative mindset. Right, right? A defensiveness. And exactly. And in reality, we never wanna point a finger at someone and be like, yo, you're doing something wrong. You know, again, even in this conversation of low carbohydrate diets, we're, we're, we wanna be very clear. We're not pointing a finger at any individual. We're just sort of saying the science could require, could use some refinement. 